In today's unit, we are going to be talking about assessing the quality of statistics. Um, and this very much ties in with the last unit by Zoe Marshman, who was talking about appraising uh, research articles in a more general sense. So today we're going to focus down on statistics and uh, research design. So this takes us back to uh, one of your first units on evidence-based dentistry. And I talked then about why we do evidence-based dentistry, why it's important, and also the main steps of evidence-based dentistry. And you may remember that I gave you a definition at that time of what evidence-based dentistry is. So it's the conscientious, explicit, and judicious use of current best evidence in making decisions about the care of individual patients. And to do good evidence-based dentistry, we have to follow a number of steps, which are these. So these are the four stages of evidence-based dentistry. You have to define the question, you have to locate and collect the evidence, you have to appraise the evidence, and you have to implement the evidence. And today's session, and that by Zoe last time, is on appraising the evidence. So this is a real key point in evidence-based dentistry. And it's also, if you remember I said at the time, one of the most difficult parts of evidence-based dentistry. It's something that gets better with experience. So the more you do it, the easier it will become. But the bottom line is, in relation to quantitative research, you can't appraise quantitative research without some knowledge of research design and statistics. So all through this module, we've been talking about different quantitative research designs. We've had a number of uh, different lecturers talking about different designs. And you've also, if you're on the Masters in Dental Public Health course, you've also covered a separate statistics module over in Shah. And some of that will obviously help you in appraising the statistics that you read in research articles. And it should be obvious to you now that when we talk about appraising statistics, we're talking about quantitative methods. This is not relevant to qualitative research. And the second thing to bear in mind, and it's a really important thing, because many students, when they first arrive uh, on this course, they think that if something appears in a peer-reviewed journal, that it will be correct and that the design will be appropriate, the statistics will be correct, the statistical tests will be correct and the analysis will be correct. This is simply not the case. Much of the research that we find, particularly on the internet, which is not peer-reviewed, has a number of errors. And this is still the case in relation to peer-reviewed journals. There are many, many errors throughout peer-reviewed articles because they slip through the peer review process. And so when you're reading research, it's really important to read it with a critical eye um, and to be critically open to the fact that some of what you're reading may not be correct, there may be inaccuracies. So I'm going to take you some of through some of those inaccuracies that we often find in research reports today. This is quite an old quote now by Hoogstraten, but quite an important one. Um, he's quite a well-known statistician in medicine, um, and you can see here he's talking about cancer journals. So obviously cancer, particularly important research field, you want your uh, research to be correctly carried out and analysed so that the interpretation of the data is correct for future clinical treatment. Um, and you can see that what he's saying is that there are many, many issues of journals, nearly all journal issues, that will have articles that have some kind of problem with them or inaccuracy in their design or reporting of what they've done. Now, whilst that study was in 1984, still, 30 years later, we still, when we look through dental journals, still find inaccuracies in many of the aspects of the design, the analysis, and the reporting of data. Just to give you um, an example, again, a very old study, but a very classical study now by Tyson and colleagues. They were looking at therapeutic trials, that is, clinical trials, randomized controlled trials, in uh, the field of perinatal medicine, so a hugely important field of research that's likely to have an impact on uh, um, young children's treatment and care. Um, so Tyson and colleagues got all of the trials within a particular period, so there were 86 trials, and they looked at some really important aspects of the research, which you can see down there on the left. I've just listed some of them. There were more within the actual study itself. So whether those studies had a clearly defined outcome, whether they had a predetermined sample size, whether they um, used statistical methods that were appropriate. And you can see there, I've highlighted in red, the um, no column. So in 25% of these studies, they didn't have a clearly defined outcome variable. In 71% of these studies, there was no predetermined sample size. In 74% of the studies, the statistical methods weren't identified. 
Now, whilst this is uh, over 30 years old now, this study, I would still say that some of these errors still creep in. And whilst we now have the consult statement, uh, which helps with telling us what should be reported for randomised controlled trials, we still get these kinds of errors. And there are a number of ethical implications of reporting and doing substandard research. Um, and so obviously when we're talking about a clinical subject, whether it be medicine or dentistry, if we um, report our research incorrectly, whether we analysed it incorrectly or interpreted it incorrectly, then we are maybe exposing our patients to the wrong treatment. And so there may be unjustified risk. There's also the misuse of resources. If we carry out research badly, then there are implications in terms of time and money. Um, and there are huge implications of publishing misleading results. And those misleading results may come about by using the wrong statistical test, but also because we might interpret them wrongly. Just uh, changing the tack slightly, uh, there was a relatively recent study by Dunn and colleagues, um, and they did a survey of why um, evidence-based dentistry isn't happening more, that is why are uh, research results not getting into clinical practice. And they found from their survey that 75% of practitioners, that's clinicians, uh, they stated that the reason why they weren't using the evidence was that they didn't understand the statistics. So the statistics part is hugely important. So just to summarise then, uh, in my opinion you need a basic understanding of statistics when critically appraising research. You need to know whether they've done something correctly and whether they've interpreted their statistics correctly. You don't need to know how to calculate statistics by hand but you do need to have a basic understanding of what they've done and why it's useful. Um, and as well as this um, PowerPoint presentation and the one following it, if you go to any basic introduction to statistics course textbook, you can read that thoroughly, you will get a good introduction to statistics um, and how to understand different tests, etc.